Islam's Theft of Europe Again, this is Abin al Huria, Son of Freedom Part 4 of 7 Let me start out by making a couple of parenthetical remarks about Islamophobia, the term Islamophobia. This is a term invented during the 1970s by Iranian fundamentalists. It is non-specific enough to be useful for many political purposes. It is a thought-stopping word. It is meant to smear anyone who justifiably criticizes Islam. It is meant to protect Islamic practices and politics from criticism. It has been picked up by the left and incorporated into the lexicon of political correctness. It has been folded into discourses about diversity and silences anyone who questions Islam. But a phobia is an irrational fear of something. Anyone who knows the history of 1400 years of jihad knows that fearing Islam is not irrational. Some Islamic Myths The Myth of Islamic Peace Islam presents itself as a civilization of peace and tolerance. Peoples without historical awareness are taken in by this myth. Anybody who knows the history of jihad knows better. Uh, on that note, let me point you to, for example, uh, Andrew Bostom. He has a um, he has compiled a massive volume on uh, on jihad, and uh, and then there's another book by uh, Robert Spencer. Uh, he just uh, finished writing a book on jihad, the history of jihad. Uh, and then also um, uh, Paul Fergosi, he has a book on the history of jihad in the West. The myth that 9-11 was a defensive act. In the Islamic view, 9-11 can be viewed as a defensive jihad because it is the result of the provocation brought on by American presence in the Muslim world. The Muslim world and the EU as its satellite continually present Israel as an occupying force, when in fact Jerusalem fell to Muslim conquest in 637 CE. In the Islamic lexicon, any action by Islamic actors to extend the Dar al-Islam is by definition not terrorism, and their agents are called resistance. Since Israel, from an Islamic standpoint, is not a legitimate state, its acts to defend itself are labeled as aggressive or disproportionate. OIC JEDA Conference 2006, some statements. Now here I'm going to read just a few statements from that meeting because it's illustrative of the language at work, how this uh, diplomatic language works. And I want you to see that uh, each statement that comes out of these meetings has two interpretations. One interpretation is for Western consumption, and the other interpretation is for uh, consumption by the Ummah. Quote, freedoms come with responsibilities. Freedom of expression should be exercised in a spirit of respect for religious and other beliefs and convictions. Mutual tolerance and respect are universal values we should uphold. End quote. Here, an intolerant political movement is asking the world to be tolerant toward it. Adopted resolution of the 61st session of the UN General Assembly to proscribe defamation of religions and religious symbols, blasphemy, denigration of all prophets, but in practice, this was an effort to make it illegal to analyze and criticize Islam. Now, this is one of the tricks. Uh, Islamic actors will push through the UN legislation or resolutions that sound very general and sound very humanitarian and very uh, egalitarian, but they really are designed to favor themselves. Okay, let's go to the UN Alliance of Civilizations High-Level Group Report 2006. Again, this is an example. I want you to see how the language operates. <clears throat> when you read these statements, you will see that if you are a Westerner, it sounds very bland, very vanilla, doesn't say much. You're not really sure what's being communicated. If you are a part of the UMA and you are engaging in Takia and you know that Takia is being, uh, being employed, 
you know what this really is intended to accomplish. The AOC is formed in 2005 by Kofi Annan. Section 3.8 of the report says, quote, The exploitation of religion by ideologues intent on swaying people to their causes has led to the misguided perception that religion itself is a root cause of intercultural conflict, end quote. This is an attempt to block the tracing of the source of terrorism back to its source in Islamic doctrine. Section 3.10 makes an artificial distinction between fundamentalism and extremism. Fundamentalism is treated as a neutral adherence to the fundamental interpretation of religious texts and has nothing inherently to do with violence. Uh, well, unless those religious texts teach violence, which they do. Fundamentalists are uh, concerned with the loss of meaning in, in secular society. Extremism, on the other hand, is inherently political and tends to lead to violence and can occur within any belief system, even Christian and Jewish. The word extremism is used to divert attention away from the jihad passages in the Quran and the Hadith. This treatment by the High Level Group Report, Section 311, explicitly disassociates terrorism done in the name of Islam from Islam itself. It explicitly denies that terrorism done in the name of Islam could have been motivated by Islamic doctrine. This uncoupling of terrorism from the jihad passages in the Quran and the Hadith has been done so in many places that it has become axiomatic. Uh, see, for example, Quran 2.191, 2.217, 4.89, 8.12, 9.13, 9.23, 47.4, and 48.29. Section 313 asserts that whatever violence comes out of, the, of religious extremism, it is motivated by the sense of injustice, not from the doctrines of belief. This is the standard propaganda that violence in the name of Islam is motivated primarily by colonialism, etc., not by the jihad passages just cited. 4.3 says, quote, More important for the purposes of this report is the fact that this history does not offer explanations for current conflicts or for the rise in hostility between Western and Muslim societies. End quote. This is patently false. Islamic doctrine, properly understood, answers this question decisively. Section 4.3 <clears throat> Quote, on the contrary, the roots of these phenomena lie in developments that took place in the 19th and 20th centuries, beginning with European imperialism, the resulting emergence of anti-colonial movements, and the legacy of confrontations between them. End quote. Any study of the history of jihad and its murder of about 270 million people and the enslavement of millions more will put the lie to this. And notice how uh, Islamic actors, they want to cut off history at the beginning of the 19th century. It goes back to uh, 622 A.D., as a matter of fact. Section 4.4 says, quote, Israel's continuing occupation of Palestinian and other Arab territories and the unresolved status of Jerusalem, a holy city for Muslims and Christians as well as Jews, have persisted with the perceived acquiescence of Western governments and thus are primary causes of resentment and anger in the Muslim world toward Western nations. This occupation has been perceived in the Muslim world as a form of colonialism and has led many to believe, rightly or wrongly, that Israel is in collusion with the West. End quote. Well, Israel lived uh, in what is called Palestine in the second millennium B.C., that antedates uh, any involvement that the Muslims had with Jerusalem. Muslims attacked and captured Jerusalem by military jihad in 637. It was not a righteous acquisition of Jerusalem. It was jihad. It was a, a military attack and a takeover of Jerusalem. Not only that, but uh, early in his career, Muhammad was courting the Jews the Jewish tribes that lived in the in the vicinity of Mecca and uh, Medina. 
he uh, he courted them and tried to win them over to his uh, his uh, self designation as a prophet speaking for God. Well, the Jews saw through his facade and they rejected his prophetic claims. Up until that time, he was directing the Qibla toward Jerusalem. When he saw that the Jews weren't going to come over to his side, he redirects the Qibla back to Mecca and then starts demonizing the Jews and fills the Quran full of literature of hatred toward the Jews. This is how Islam operates. From page 36, quote, The United States, the European Union, and the Organization of the Islamic Conference should set a joint goal of taking the number of youth exchanges that, ex that occur between their countries from the bottom of the list of interregional exchanges to the top. Priority should be given to, extend, to extended stay exchanges, group exchanges, and exchanges subsidized enough to allow participation from strata of society other than elite populations. The intent behind this bullet is to use youth exchanges not to build understanding between North and South, but to conduct dawah. What is going on here is they want to bring, they wanted to be able to bring students in from the Muslim world into Europe to do exchanges and to proselytize Europeans, to integrate Muslims into Europe and to help them to find, to learn the ropes of living in Europe and, to, and possibly to plant roots in Europe or to at least find a bastion where they can enter uh, when they finish their uh, university education. And on the other hand, bringing European students into the Muslim world and teaching them Islam and getting them to want to become Muslims. At least it, they would take Europeans who had already been softened by leftist narrative uh, and opened up because of their post-Christian orientation, bring them into the Muslim world let them visit a university for, for a year or so and and teach them Islam and immerse them, them in Islam and maybe even get them to say the Shahada, then send them back to Europe now as, as new Muslims to evangelize their own people, or I should say Dawahs, their own people. From page 39, quote, The European Union should work with member states to standardize and integrate data collection across the continent which mo monitor immigrants' access to and experience of the labor and housing markets as well as health, social, educational, and other community services, end quote. The OIC here is promoting a policy wherein Europeans are expected to pay for their own colonization. Again from page 39, quote, American and European universities and research centers should expand research into the significant economic, cultural, and social contributions of immigrant communities to American and European life, end quote. <clears throat> um, like, for example, rape gangs, living on public support, and creating no-go zones. I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, tongue, tongue in cheek, of course. Quote, likewise, they should promote publications coming from the Muslim world on a range of subjects related to Islam and the Muslim world, end quote. The OIC wants Europe to promote propaganda of itself at its own expense. This is the arrogance of the supremacism of Islam. Open abrogation of national identities. It has become common speech in, for example, Sweden and Germany for politicians to abrogate the idea that their nations have a national identity worth preserving. Bet Yor talks about this, and she says that this is actually an expression of dimitude when you have a people who are openly, uh, you know, abrogating their own national identity. It's like, uh, it's like the alpha male talking to the beta male, and the beta male has his eyes down to the ground because he's ashamed. He's being shamed, and he's being intimidated. That is the, that is the stance that Europe now has toward the Islamic world. And Bat Yor calls that an expression of demification. In the most blatant cases, these politicians deny history and pretend that there, there never was a national identity or that the notion of national identity is a social construct, a la Foucault. I'm talking about uh, Michel uh, Foucault. And, as in an, and in fact is fluid or negotiable, as, for example, in postmodern theory. 
Pathway for Emergence of a World Caliphate. Insofar as the EU OIC axis through the EAD and similar mechanisms have successfully stolen away the national sovereignty of European states, and insofar as the EU adopts measures with which incrementally erodes the member state's identity, it has created a pathway for the extension of the OIC caliphate over all of Europe as well. Once Europe has been Islamized sufficiently, as measured on numerous levels, including the installation of Sharia law, the OIC of the not-too-distant future can be considered to have 56 plus 28 equals 84 members. In the same way that the Islamic world has replaced the UDHR with the Cairo UDHRI, the UN can expect to eventually be dominated and then replaced by the OIC. This is the aim of Islam. I know it may be difficult for you to believe it, but this really is the intent of the OIC. And uh, when you really begin to understand the arrogance of the Islamic world, and the OIC in particular, uh, you can appreciate that this is their intent. It's not so far-fetched. Islam's creation of an alternative world. The OIC is a block of 56 nations, which is trying to swallow up the 28 additional nations of Europe. Its goal is to eventually become an unstoppable voting block in the UN. Then it wants to replace the UN. I just said that. Evidence for the last statement is that the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam is Islam's answer to the UDHR. Islam does not accept many of the precepts of the UDHR, so it creates its own world. When you think about it, the Islamic world, because of its supremacism, it does not want to integrate into a world governance. It wants to replace it. The OIC created is SESCO, that is the Islamic Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization to replace UNESCO in the coming caliphate. All of these organizations reflect the supremacist characters of Islam. Emerging Narratives Regarding Islam After 9-11, an emerging, uh, emerging narratives in Europe and the U.S. were that, for example, Islam was a religion of peace, Terrorist acts were aberrations of the true, peaceful Islam. Terrorist acts were committed by a small fringe element that did not replace Islam. Terrorist acts are not coupled to any particular doctrine. That's why they are called violent extremism, which, is, uh, which really masks what's going on. Extremism is, as often as not, homegrown and personal. Any violence from the Muslim community is due to injustices from colonialism, poverty, Islamophobia, Israeli terrorism, Israeli occupation. Islam's theft of Europe. Again, this is Abin al-Hurriya, Son of Freedom, Part 4 of 7.